Hey, so good to see you guys. I just want to say um, on behalf of Mary and I and the staff, just the fact that you guys are here, uh, we absolutely love that, uh, seeing you guys. I think this is going to uh, become kind of the um, possibly the most important uh, gathering to just open up the Word and to go verse by verse. It's something that we started kind of as just a test run this fall, I remember sitting in staff, and uh, we were thinking, hey, if 50 people showed up, that would be awesome, and you guys have gone uh, way beyond that, and so uh, we're excited that this is not just going to be a this fall thing, uh, but we are going to continue this and study. Uh, we don't know what we'll study next, but we will study something. Uh, I can tell you it will be in the Bible, so that's all I can tell you, but we will study the Bible together and uh, I'm excited that our church is going deeper. In fact, even in this chapter where Paul prays about uh, that our roots would grow down into his love, that's really what's happening as we're studying the word of God. Our, root, our, our roots are, are growing down. And that not only provides nourishment for us as believers, his word nourishes us, but also roots provide the stability uh, for the tree. Uh, so that when the winds and adversity come, we will stand strong. And when certain doctrines kind of blow in, breeze into the church, we can identify them as, as false, as things that we're not going to go after, that we're going to stay rooted and grounded uh, in, in love and in Christ. So I just want to say to you guys, I'm just so proud of you uh, that you're here tonight, that you would take time out of your busy week. And that just shows a uh, uh, spiritual hunger, and we are super pumped uh, that you guys are here. Okay, Ephesians, uh, we're in chapter three tonight. I know we're in chapter four uh, just a couple days ago on Sunday, but we're the way that we're set up every other week, we're just going to have to kind of go back and dig in, and, and, and to me, that's not a problem. Hopefully, that's not an issue uh, for you, but we've already covered chapter four on Sunday, but now we're back looking verse by verse through uh, chapter three. And I just want to remind you that Ephesians is kind of broken up into really kind of two different segments. Right down the middle, uh, chapters one through three uh, deals with our position in Christ, and that's where we'll be tonight, the last part of our position. It's also the doctrinal portion of the book, our vertical relationship uh, with God. It's the declaration of heavenly truths, what God has already accomplished and the overarching theme is that God is creating his family, Christ's church, and it also shows us how uh, he expects us to live. And then chapters four through six, that will come two weeks from tonight. In fact, Mary covered it on, uh, started to cover it on Sunday with chapter four, but that's now, we're gonna transition after tonight into uh, our practice on earth. So the first three chapters are, our position in Christ, but then it shifts to, and it gets very practical. In fact, Mary said that this week. It's kind of where the rubber beats the road. It's it's the things now that we're uh, that God wants us to do, and now we're move, we'll move away from the vertical. We'll look at that tonight, but then next time we'll get into that horizontal relationship with how we practically live this out with others. And instead of God's accomplishments in the first three chapters, the last three chapters we'll look at our Christian assignments. So it's what God has accomplished, but now it's what he expects us to do uh, with that. And so tonight we're in, in chapter three, we'll start in verse one, and Paul says there, when I think of all this. So we need to pause there for just a second, because what, what he's talking about is, what he, when, when, what he means by that is when I think of all this, he's already covered some things in chapters one and to remember, the letter was written without chapters, without numbers. So he's just referring back to what he has already uh, shared with people. And he's talked about in chapter one that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ, that God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom by the blood of his son and forgave our sins, that we are chosen, we are loved, we've been adopted. Verse nine says, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ. That's a reoccurring theme. We'll look at that in detail in a minute, that his plan was to bring heaven to earth, to make all things new and to restore what man had in the garden and then lost because of sin. I love what uh, author Philip Yancey says, grace is the most powerful perplexing force in the universe. And I believe the only answer to our twisted, violent planet. 
Wow, think about that for a minute. It's so good. And then in chapter two, Paul says, remember, we're looking at what he said, when I think of all this, this is what he's talking about, that we were dead in sin, but now we've been made alive in Christ. Because again, God is so rich and loved us so much. It's by his grace that we're saved. It's a sheer gift. It's not a reward for being a good little boy or a good little girl. It's not based on the things that we've done. Uh, None of that. It's a sheer gift. We didn't earn it. We can't deserve it. Uh, and, uh, and, and he gave it to us simply as a gift. And then he goes into that uh, we Gentiles were outsiders. We were excluded from citizenship. We were outside of the covenant he deals with. Living in the world without God and without hope is the language that he uses, which is so true. If you don't have God, you don't have hope. You're hopeless without God. But now Christ has made us one people. Now Jew and Gentile, that's the mystery making up the body of Christ, Christ broke down the wall of hostility that separated us, and he's now united us, how? By the Holy Spirit, making literally us a brand new people, literally a brand new race, a new creation, a new species, now one body, Gentiles, us Gentiles are no longer strangers or foreigners. Paul says you are citizens, members of God's family, and together we now are becoming God's house, his temple. With Christ as our cornerstone, the spirit living and breathing in all of us, friends, that's good news. Can somebody say amen? Okay, so now we get to the second part of verse one here. When I think of all this, we just covered all that. Chapters one and two, things that he's already covered. He says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now remember, Paul is calling himself a prisoner of Christ. Think about that. He's not saying I'm a prisoner of Rome. Now, is he... A prisoner of Rome. Yes, but he is subject to a higher authority, just like you and I are subject to a higher authority. The Roman iron chains are not holding him as a prisoner. He is saying it's the chains of Christ's love that are holding me here. It's, it's something supernatural. It's something higher. He knew that he was under the authority of Christ. Now, if you look back to chapter 1 verse 21, he deals with this. Paul says, now he or Christ is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. That's why he said, I'm a prisoner of Christ. He was under heaven's authority. He goes on to say, for the benefit of you Gentiles. Now remember, it's right here that he opens a new window, that he, we talked about this a couple weeks ago on Sunday. It's like if you're on your computer on your phone and you open up a new app. It's like he started this thought uh, and then he gets to this point and in the new living, it has dot, dot, dot. In other translations, it has a dash because he digresses here. He goes out on a, a rabbit trail. He opens up a whole new line of thinking. And I believe what triggered that was the word Gentile because this, was, this is who he was called to minister to. And I think the minute that he said Gentile, he was prompted by the Spirit uh, to just flow out this incredible, deep theological thoughts in the verses to come that we will look at. And I think it was that word Gentile. He starts this thought, but then he's diverted. At the, at the word Gentile, I, again, I think it seems to spark this thought. And he shares with him how, how I think how significant they are to God and to him. Now, Paul is in jail because of the Gentiles. And you can reference that and you can see Acts chapter 21. Um, There was a mob that was trying to kill uh, Paul. Uh, Roman soldiers had to come in and basically save him. He was being beaten to death uh, by devout Jews. They were gonna kill him. Um, And then uh, after he's been uh, kind of arrested and detained, Paul says, I wanna speak to this crowd. They were dead silent. And Paul is speaking to this crowd of hostile people, but there's an eerie silence, the Bible says, that is over them. But even in that speech, as soon as he mentions the word Gentiles again, they go crazy. They tear off their coats. They start, they throw off their coats. They start throwing dust in the air. I don't know what that's all about. And they just go crazy. They're wanting to, they're wanting to kill him. And again, Paul had such a uh, affection and a calling and a love for the Gentiles 
that I believe again that, that it's that word Gentiles that causes him, that the Spirit causes him to go to this whole new line of thinking that's going to help the Gentiles understand this mystery uh, that, that God is revealing at this time in the world. And so, again, while Paul is in jail, uh, he's in Caesarea, and he stands before uh, Festus and Felix, and then King Agrippa, and then he, for his own safety, he claims and lets them know, I'm a Roman citizen, and he, he calls to stand before Caesar, so they ship him off to Rome. But again, he's not a prisoner of Rome. Be certain of this, he is a prisoner of Christ, and his mission is for the Gentiles. And again, I think that word sparked all of this theological depth that he is bringing out. Uh, and maybe he thought about his encounter that he had with Christ. In Acts 9, you can see Paul's conversion. And it, it says that a light from heaven, heaven suddenly shone down on him. Saul fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up, go, and you will be told what to do. Saul got up, but he was blind. For three days, he didn't eat, he didn't drink. And then God had prepared Ananias in a vision to meet Saul, but God had to convince Ananias because he knew Saul was a Christian killer and Ananias was a Christian and that was an issue. And the spirit convinced Ananias to go and find him and told him exactly where to go to uh, Judas's house on a street called Straight, different Judas, don't worry about it, and find him. And then when Ananias ministered to him, like scales fell off and the spirit of God filled uh, Saul at, at, and, and Saul was now, uh, then Saul was baptized and brought into uh, the, the, the body of Christ through that. And, and then uh, the reality is that God had said in, in Acts 9 and verse 15, Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. So Saul considered it, Paul considered it, Saul turned to Paul, Paul considered it an honor, a privilege to suffer for Christ. Now, the reason I'm taking a little bit of time on this is sometimes as a pastor, someone comes to me with a complaint. And when I think about what Paul was dealing with, um, I can't help but to think that that complaint is extremely petty. Even in my own life, when I have a complaint to God, like uh, if I have to, like today, I was behind a car and they stopped and they were letting someone out uh, on the street uh, while the, uh, at a stoplight while the light was green. And I don't know what, what they were doing. I don't know what they needed, but I could tell they had stopped and we were sitting there for about a minute. And I'll just be honest with you, I started to get a little, um, a little angered. Um, and then I realized something. We live in a world where little tiny inconveniences, like a little traffic or someone doesn't get our food order right at a restaurant or a number of any other uh, first world problems, we, we kind of get agitated. And, and here's what I thought of today, especially in light of tonight and talking about Paul as a prisoner of Christ. I have a long way to grow. Anybody else? I have a long way to mature. And I'm, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be honest. I am far from, from this mentality. And, and it is convicting in the best of ways when Paul says, I am a prisoner, a prisoner of Christ, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Um, so verse two, here's where he digresses. This is where he goes off on his uh, kind of rabbit trail, this glorious theological rabbit trail. He says, assuming by the way that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. Verse three, as I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. Here's that word, mystery. And in English, it's something that is a secret, something that is dark, something that is obscure, even something that is puzzling, something we can usually figure out. We, we, we go uh, 
you know, and, and we want to figure out this mystery. That's not what this mystery is. This mystery, it's the Greek word uh, mysterion, which is very different than our English translation of the word mystery. It is a secret, that's true, uh, and it's, it, it is something that is a truth that is divinely hidden from human knowledge. So it's something that God has wrapped up, sealed up. In fact, a good example uh, of this is uh, Daniel chapter 2, and I think this is in uh, your notes. It might be ahead a little bit in your notes, uh, but Daniel chapter 2, where God tells Daniel that this vision that I'm giving you, this prophecy that I'm giving you, I want you to seal it up. It's not for now. It's for your eyes only. It is something that I want you to seal, put under lock and key, and then at the right time when knowledge increases and in the end times, which is now, I will reveal it. And this is, the, this is that mystery. It is a mystery that only God can reveal. It's truth divinely revealed to us. And Paul is the chosen spokesperson to reveal this incredible, incredible mystery, uh, the mystery of Christ's body, the mystery of Jew and Gentile becoming one. And so there's some hints that we see in the Old Testament. I want to take some time on this because I think this is important and I think it's very valuable and I think it adds uh, to our understanding of this mystery. First of all, we see in Genesis 12, the call of Abram before he was Abraham and had that name change. Uh, he was a wannabe father, but God said, you're going to be the father of many nations. And we see in Genesis 12 that God says to him, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And here's the, here it is. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So when you think about all the families, that goes beyond uh, just one nation. It's all nations. And so here we see a hint of the mystery in the Old Testament. We see it again in, in Jacob's dream at Bethel. And this is not only the promise resta restated, but God actually adds something to the promise for Jacob's sake. So uh, this is in Genesis, and let me just read it to you. As he slept, this is Jacob, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. Some translations say ladder. A better translation is stairway or even ramp, uh, and it could be translated as a ramp. And at the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather, Abraham, the God of your father, Isaac, the ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And here it is again. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I finish giving you everything I've promised you. It's interesting that what's added to the promise of Abraham is the promise of God's presence. That's what's different about this particular promise. And the reason it's so significant in this, in this situation is Jacob was running. He was scared. He was on the run. He was all alone. He was in incredible fear. And what did God tell him? I'm with you. And it's not just in this moment at the stairway to heaven. It is in everywhere you go, I will go with you. But note that the hint of the mystery, again, is seen here, not just with Abraham, but again, with Jacob's dream at Bethel, that the promise that all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so Isaiah 45, 14, here's another hint of the future conversion of Gentiles. Uh, this is what the Lord says. It's a prophetic word that is given 700 years before Christ came way before Paul was writing this letter. And he says, you will rule the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, and the Sabians, that's just South Arabians, and they will come to you with all their merchandise and it will all be yours. They will follow you as prisoners in chains. Listen to this. They will fall to their knees. This is the Gentiles, because he's talking about the Egyptians and the 
Ethiopians and the South Arabians. These are Gentile nations. They will fall to their knees in front of you and say, God is with you and he is the only God, there is no other. So there's another hint from Isaiah hundreds and hundreds of years before this mystery is revealed. There's little hints, little hints about what God is gonna do. And then Isaiah 49, 6, God speaking directly to Israel. He says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles and you, Israel, will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And then Hosea 2, 23 is another hint of this mystery that Paul is uncovering. I will show love to those I call not love and to those I call not my people, I will say, or God will say, now you are my people, and they will reply, you are our God. So I find that incredibly interesting that all throughout the Old Testament, there are these hints, they're big hints. And see, it's not that Jews didn't believe in salvation for the Gentiles because Gentiles would get converted way back in, in those days. And they would have to go through all the rituals and and circumcision and all of the temple things and all of the rules and regulations to become Jewish and to be part of, uh, you know, part of that Jewish nation. But what the Jews could never see and still to this day, according to Romans 11, the hardening of the Jewish heart towards Gentiles, they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They cannot believe the the mystery that Paul's going to uncover here, that Jew and Gentile become one. They could see that Gentiles could convert, but they couldn't, they can't grasp grace that because of what Jesus has done, he's made a completely new race, tearing down the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile and making them one. They just, they, still to this day, the majority of, of Jews can't, can't see this. Let's look at verses four and five now. Paul continues again on his kind of his rabbit trail here. He'll pick up the thought some verses later, but he says, as you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, it's a capital S there, by the Holy Spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. So Paul's saying it is now time for the mystery. All the other things are hints. All the other things have led up to this, but now God is time for him to reveal this hidden truth, to reveal this truth that Jew and Gentile in Christ have become one body of Christ, one temple, one family. And so a good example again of this, of that sealing up, I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't have the references. Daniel 12, verse four. This, by the way, is 500 years before Christ. Uh, the Bible says this, but Daniel, write down what you have seen and heard. But God says, keep this prophecy, this vision, a secret. In other words, it's a confidential report for your eyes only. Seal it up, put it under lock and key so that it will not be understood until the end times when travel and education shall be vastly increased, when knowledge shall be vastly increased. What do we see in our world today? Knowledge vastly increased. And even in Paul's time, knowledge was being vastly increased. I mean, it is on hyperspeed, warp speed now. But this secret was locked until God revealed it by his spirit. So here is the mystery revealed. As simple as Paul can say it, it's very straightforward language. Verse six, and this is God's plan. Here's the mystery revealed. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus. Or a better translation might be, or because they are united in Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? This is what for hundreds and hundreds of years had been hinted at. And now it's being revealed, and Paul is the messenger, unsealing, unlocking, revealing this hidden revelation, this truth that God now is, being, is making plain for everyone to see. Verse seven, by God's grace and mighty power, 
I have been given the privilege of serving. That word serving there in uh, the ESV, it's the word in many other translations, it's the word minister, or ministering, the privilege of serving or ministering. Those two words, ministry and service, are, simul, are, are, are synonyms. They're the same word. So when someone says, oh yeah, Scott, you're the minister, you do all the work, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna disagree and go, well, um, let me share what God says about you. God actually says that every Christian is a minister. So I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and practice that right now. Would you turn to the person next to you and just say, you're a minister, go ahead. And turn to someone else and say, you too. We are all ministers. Some of us, sometimes we think, oh man, Paul was just incredible, and he was, don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, Paul was just a servant. We are just simply servants. Paul was a minister. We are ministers of God. And that word is diakonos, which literally means, uh, you know, that we are serving. In fact, on your little extra notes there, um, it has a, let's flip it in here. Let's see. I think it's in the middle part. Um, Yeah, there it is. Uh, So the minister is, this is according to Wood, a table waiter who is always at the bidding of his customers. So Paul is calling himself a waiter. I'm just simply a waiter, and I'm here for you Gentiles. I'm a minister. I'm a, a servant. Paul identified himself in many of his letters as just, we are simply God's servants here to serve you. And so, You and I are ministers just like Paul is a minister. And Paul is saying here, God empowers us by his grace and his dunamis, his mighty power that we have been given the, look at that, I've been given the privilege. How many of us look at serving God and serving others as a privilege? I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I can see it as an obligation and I'm not sure I'm alone. Sometimes we have our own personal stuff going on, and we see it as an interruption or an obligation. But Paul here, remember, a prisoner of Christ, by the way, a servant to the Gentiles, a servant of Christ, he says it is a privilege. It is a privilege to wait and to serve other people. Man, I love that. And see, I think we tend, he starts this verse seven, by God's grace. We tend to limit grace only to salvation But what Paul is reminding us of that grace is not just given for salvation, which it is. Grace is given for serving. It's not just given for salvation. That's why John Piper says grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned. Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. So it's not just grace for salvation. It's grace, yes, for salvation, but also for serving empowering us to do his will. The ESV says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Again, minister and servant, synonymous in the Bible. Never forget that you are a minister. Every Christian is a minister, not just the people you guys call pastor. And by the way, we'll see this in a minute. We are all on the same level. I'm not at a higher level than you. We are all God's sheep. Can somebody say amen? I should have said, can somebody say, bah, but that would be corny. So let's keep going. Every member has a ministry. Mary actually talked about this this past Sunday. She said, no matter what part you are, she even said toenail, you serve a purpose. You serve a vital purpose that is necessary to the body. And this is Paul's message here and in other parts of the New Testament. Paul says, I'm a minister, but that title is a title of service, not exaltation. That minister is that table waiter, bidding of his customers, waiting on them hand and foot. Um, One who executes the, uh, the wishes of another. It could be the servant of a king. Paul already said, I'm a prisoner of Christ. He's a prisoner of the king. And we serve like Paul, empowered by grace. And we should see it like Paul. I'm I'm hammering this home just so I can hear it again. 
We should see it as a privilege, that it is a privilege to serve. Klein Snodgrass says, if grace enlists and empowers, why is passivity so common in the church? Christianity is not a religion of works, but it is still very much a religion of action. I like that. You cannot be a Christian and be passive. I'm just letting that sink in. You cannot be a Christian, I'll say it differently, and not serve. Don't call yourself a Christ follower because Christ was a servant of all. I would challenge any believer that says, oh yeah, I'm fully devoted to Christ, but I don't serve anyone, anywhere, anytime. It's a passive, false Christianity. Actually, at the heart of that is self, which is anti-Christ. Okay, that's something for another teaching. I'm going to get back into get back into this. Mary says, "Teach, not preach." I can't. I'm a preacher. Okay. Verse eight. Here we go. Let's teach. Verse eight. Paul, though I am the least deserving of all God's people. Wow. Okay. Again, what a grip on grace. Why does he say this? Probably because he had persecuted and killed Christians. And he was saying, I am the least qualified, least deserving of all of God's people. Um, He had beaten them, thrown them in jail, had them killed. But he goes on to say, but he, God graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. And tonight, one of our questions talks about the endless treasures that we can go back over the first few chapters and bring those up and discuss what are those endless treasures treasures. It's just beautiful language. Paul writing to Timothy, he, he kind of echoes the same thought of being the least deserving. He says it differently in 1 Timothy 1.15. Christ Jesus came into the world, Paul says, to save sinners. And he says, I am the worst of them all. He called himself in another place, the chief of sinners. So he had this radical gri- grip on grace, which was really a radical humility. And I think this is what fueled Paul his entire ministry, even down to his last days and his last season, where his cry out to God was that I might know Christ and him crucified. He had a grip on grace, and he had a incredible, uh, humble heart, again, that saw serving, even saw his imprisonment as a privilege. I'm, a, I'm in jail, chained by the love of Christ a privilege to serve you Gentiles. Man, oh man, this is incredible theology, incredible, incredibly convicting. So Paul refers to the riches of Christ that are beyond comprehension, cannot fully be counted or measured. Uh, Ephesians is full of these references. Chapter one, it's grace, kindness, love. And he even says every spiritual blessing, that's just so vast. First Peter 1, 4 states the treasures of Christ that are that they are eternal, that these spiritual blessings in Christ, these, these uh, endless treasures in Christ, they're eternal. They, they will never end. They'll last forever. Second Corinthians 4, treasures of Christ are incomparable. They're limitless, he says. Matthew 6 states that the treasures of Christ cannot be stolen from us. They, and, and by the way, treasures of Christ can only come through inheritance through a death. Think about that. Who died? Jesus died. So now we have inherited these endless treasures that are available in Christ. You can find that in Hebrews chapter 9. Here's verse 9. Paul says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious, that's the mysterion, again, this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God was masking it. He was concealing it. But now he is, the re- he is revealing it. I love how Paul gives God all of the credit, all of the glory, all of the honor for this, even calls him God, the creator of all things, saying this is his secret, his plan, his mystery that he is now revealing me. I'm just that chosen waiter, diakonios, that minister to explain it to you guys. Verse 10, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. 
So J.D. Watson, this is in your notes, comments on that Greek word, polyupokilos. Whoa, that's a fun one. As it relates to God's wisdom, this wisdom speaks of knowledge of the most precious things, knowledge of the things that really have substance, that really matter. That's why preaching to Paul and, and, and in the church is such a big deal. The word manifold is an incredible world, word uh, that is found only here, polyupokilos, in the New Testament, only used one time. Paul shoves a couple of Greek words together and makes this uh, word that means multifaceted or uh, uh, multi-varied. Uh, uh, it, it's a compound verb by adding the prefix uh, English is poly or many, uh, and Paul makes this word say multifaceted or the most varied. It's designated to make known God's understanding of the things that matter most. So that's what Paul is trying to uh, share with us here, that it's through the church that God is going to share and, and, and broadcast his multifaceted wisdom to the principalities and powers of the air, and of course, anyone else that wants to watch, but I believe that it's mainly referring to demons, and we'll get to that big time in chapter six. That's coming. But the princes and the powers of the air that God, through the church, through this new family, this body of Christ, the church, Jew and Gentile, the mystery revealed that it's one body coming together, that it's through that one body, the body of Christ, that the principalities and powers are going to see the very plan of God and the wisdom of God revealed to the nation. That's why it is so vital when Jesus prayed, Father, make them one, his final prayer before he went to the cross, that unity is an essential. Unity is not just a little thing that we talk about. It is the main thing. And it's really what Paul is, is preaching here and preaching throughout other letters, that you guys are one in Christ. And that is proving to Satan and all of the dark powers that still rule and reign in this fallen world, God is doing it through the church. I, I, I'm not sure we can grasp how incredible this is. That's why, again, I stated it when we preached on this a couple weeks ago, that you can't call yourself a Christian and be apart from community, be apart from the body. You can't say you play in the NBA and not be on a team. You can't say, I belong to Christ, but I really don't like the church. That's not possible. We are the church unified, and God is using us to display his plan and his mystery to the entire world. To me, this is just, this is just mind-blowing stuff. And the church is assigned a lofty and cosmic role in the end times. The church is what God is using to display, literally to broadcast, to demonstrate his wisdom in its rich variety, this diverse, multicolored, many-sided, great variety is seen in a piece, what that, that word means, it's a piece of beautiful, beautiful, intricate, embroidered piece of clothing, or a beautifully painted painting with just such rich and depth color and shading. It's like in the it's like in the Old Testament, the Septuagint uses the same word and thought, and the, the Greek, uh, 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 Septuagint is the Greek uh, language of the Old Testament instead of Hebrew or Ara Aramaic, and it's the coat that Joseph had, that coat of intricately woven colors, just the most beautiful thing anyone had ever seen. Paul says that's the church. That's what God is doing. And so I want to say, I want to take a minute here at City Church. This is in your notes here. So at City Church, we need to just see this, and I hope I can say it correctly. So God creates the church. And then the church, it's our job as Christ is the head with grace empowering us to create the culture that is here. And what do I mean by that? That we serve one another like Mary talked about on Sunday. And, and every, every one of us is vital to the building up of the body. But we create a culture of love and unity and grace and kindness, like she said on Sunday, making allowances, being patient with one another, making allowances for one another's faults. And we, we create that type of culture. So God creates the church. We, under Christ's rule, create the culture. 
The culture creates the atmosphere that people come into. Have you ever come into someone's house and you could just tell something's wrong? Or have you ever gone into a business and you could just tell something's off? There's something in the atmosphere. There's tension. There's maybe even a darkness. There's some, I'm sure all of us have. I know I have. I've come in somewhere and it's just like, whoa, something is going on in here. I mean, honestly, sometimes the girls have come into Mary and I where maybe we've had, uh, we don't argue, we just have intense fellowship. So we had some <laughs> in, intense fellowship going on and they can come in and they go, what is wrong with you two, you know? And now that they're adults, they can see that. When they were kids, we could probably mask them, but now they're like, whoa, what's going on? Something's not right in the air. But see, when God creates the church and through Christ, the church creates culture with this unity and love and kindness and patience and serving one another, the culture creates an atmosphere that is attractive to those that are far from Christ. And that atmosphere creates momentum in Christ's body. It gives us movement. That, that grace fuels us to keep serving, and it's a joy and a privilege to serve. Then that momentum creates growth, and growth, G, uh, Jesus wants us to go and produce fruit and fruit that will remain and that's what happens. Grow, momentum creates growth. Growth creates glory, and glory goes to God. Does that make sense to anybody? To me, this is a, the framework how I, how I want Mary and I and our staff to lead this church, that it, all the glory is God's, but that it is our responsible. It is our responsibility to fight for one another, to have each other's backs. And what I'd like to say, let me use a different example. I've gone into churches that have the most beautifully manicured grounds. Now, we have some great grounds, thanks to Kirk and Larry and the grounds team and Greg Sippy and all you others, uh, that, that Wayne and, and all you guys that come out. And I can't list you all right now, but you know who you are and I love you and thank God for you. And we have some beautifully manicured grounds. But I've been to some places that have spent millions of dollars on their landscaping. Now, ours look like a million bucks, but we haven't spent a million. But the minute that I've walked into the church, there's something in the air that's not right. Later to find out this one church, two in particular, but one I'm thinking of right now, when I left there, it wasn't long before where they were in the news because there was a scandal happening at that same church. Walked in, it was beautiful. It was immaculate. Friends, let's not be a church that looks good on the outside. Let's be a church that has the right atmosphere on the inside that is so attractive. Momentum and growth and God getting the glory because we have this unity that we have fought for. Man, I'm so far behind, it's not even funny. Um, I am preaching up here, not teaching, but let's, let's, let's keep going. Um, I, I, I want to stay on this for just a minute. We, we've all come from different places and backgrounds. We grew up in different environments and family cultures. We have different political views. Um, we have different likes and interests and hobbies, even pursuits. But this is the message Paul is saying, in Christ we are one. This is the culture that we're building here at this church. Uh, we can't focus on our likes, our opinions, and our preferences, but on Jesus, the gospel, and the family that he has created here called the church. And I'll say this, we need to get comfortable with being a little uncomfortable. We need to get comfortable with being just a little bit uncomfortable. Unity is not some non-essential, it is vital. And we are the answer to Jesus's prayer to make them one. Um, by the way, the same wisdom that is being displayed by God to the powers of the air, that's corporately, but also we can take this promise individually because we are the church. What that means is that if you are going through some type of problem or challenge or storm of the enemy, um, nothing catches God off guard. He already knows it's coming. He knows what you're going through. In, in his will and in his, 
in his uh, sovereignty, he's allowing these winds or this storm to blow into your life. But what James tells us to do, if any of us lacks wisdom, ask God. And that same rich variety of wisdom that he is displaying, that multicolored, beautifully, intricately woven wisdom that he's displaying through the church is available to each of us when we need it. James says, ask of God if you lack wisdom and God will give it generously. That when we don't know what to do, we ask God, God, help me. What should I do? And God gives us wisdom. He gladly tells us from a bountiful supply of wisdom and, and, and he will give it freely to us. And I find great I find great peace in that, that no matter what I go through, God has the wisdom and wants to pour it out on my life to help me outlast that enemy storm or overcome that storm. And some of you, I think that means a lot to you because you're going through a lot right now. Um, verse 12, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. See, we're no longer Gentiles without God, without hope. Now we are in Christ. We're in him and he's in us. And this confidence and boldness has come into our life because now we're his kids. My kids come into my house. They don't have to ask permission to go into the fridge. They take whatever they want, even if I was planning to eat it later. They eat it first. And I go, where's my stuff? They go, sorry, dad, I ate it. And they even say with a little attitude, and I love it, and it's okay. I love that they have that boldness and that confidence. We are full family members now, full privileges, no longer outsiders, no longer strangers. This is Paul's language. No longer foreigner, foreigners, co-heirs to every spiritual blessing, all a gift of grace, not deserved, not worked for. We can't boast about it, but he did it all. And now we are one. We have it all. Bold access, not given to us in heaven some future date, but right now we have access. Those two nouns, boldness and confidence, are actually joined together to express one idea, one action. It's a thought that's close to Hebrews chapter four, verse six. Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace. That's the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need. Uh, when we need it. Verse 13, so please, Paul says, don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. So now, Paul in his chains is actually being an encouragement. Friends, when you're going through something, never stop encouraging others. It's how God's grace is gonna come back and energize you to press through. So now he closes that window that he opened up and, and with this deep theological truth. And he now, um, again, these, theo these theologies are embedded in the first part of this chapter. They're extremely important for our life. I would encourage you to study between, uh, study this over and over. And honestly, the gulf between Paul's description of the church and our current reality, I think can be a little bit embarrassing of what he says the church is and what we kind of currently see. And I'm not, I'm not bad-mouthing our church. I'm saying I know we're working uh, towards this, um, that God wants heaven displayed through us. An impossible task without grace, an impossible task without the power of the Holy Spirit, but it is possible with those things. We can be Christ's body, showing God's limitless wisdom to every demonic force that catches a glimpse of the Christ in us, pushing back darkness we can as a church body. Christ is the head with the very light of Christ. And then Luke 4.18, you might make note of that. Christ's mission is continued through us. In Luke 4.18, Jesus quotes Isaiah, the part of the scroll uh, where he basically says, this is my mission, this is my mandate. Now that is our mission and that is our mandate. His mission, our mission, we are the church of the living God, unstoppable from our neighborhood to every nation of the world. So verses 14 through 21, I'm gonna close on the next few minutes here. This section resumes the thought that began in three, verse one, 
uh, but it was uh, interrupted by Paul's opening that new window in verses 2 through 13 that we've already looked at in a lot of detail. But now Paul picks up his apostolic prayer to the Ephesian uh, believers, and let me uh, read it to you. This is Paul's prayer for spiritual growth. He says, when I think of all this, now note, what, is, what did he start in verse 1? When I think of all this, so he picks up that thought again. And really, the Ephesians letter is really a prayer letter. It's Paul praying these prayers over the church and even teaching the church how to pray for one another. This is actually a good prayer that you can pray for, not just yourself, but other people. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Remember, we talked about that root system early on, that it not only brings nourishment, but that also roots give you stability uh, uh, through trials and circumstances and, 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 and winds and storms. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And then he gives God all the glory here. Now all glory to God who is able, and he, he reveals God as the source of all of this. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us. Whose power is it? It's his power. It's his dunamis. It's his spirit. It's all his we're his servants. Paul is his prisoner. We are his ministers. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So the main intent of Paul's prayer here is clear. He wants his readers strengthened by God's spirit so that they will know the love of Christ intimately, to know Christ's presence and to receive and to give his love. As we encounter God's love and experience that love, which Paul is praying for, then we are filled with love. When we are filled with love, then we can share his love. It's his love overflows. It's shed abroad in our hearts. It flows up out of us. The Holy Spirit's first and main fruit is love. You can know that we are believers by the love we have for one another. If someone says I'm a Christian and they're not serving, I question their sincerity of following Christ. If someone says they're a Christian and they are not loving, again, I would question their sincerity of being filled with the Spirit and really fully following Christ. And when we're filled with his love and we share it with others, that's why we say here at City Church, love everyone always. Okay, with that, we've got to stop and get to table talk. I am six minutes over. I don't want to steal any more time from you guys. There is a really cool prayer that I printed out in here at the very end. I would encourage you to take with you this week and pray. Okay, talk amongst yourselves. Love you guys.